Hey everybody, George Kittle here with Hidden Pearls Podcast, along with my co-host, really the man of the show, Bruce Kittle, with Emma Kittle behind the scenes, the family podcast. Thanks for tuning in today. We've got a special one for you guys with the world famous Hall of Fame nomination, Pat McAfee, absolute stud, Potter in the NFL, fantastic. Now we all know him, we all follow him on Twitter, uh, wonderful voice. I had a great conversation with him about going through uh, his career, upbringing, NFL, getting out of the NFL, starting his crazy uh, media empire, basically, different people he's worked with, things that have inspired him, things that have changed his mind, affected his life, and kind of set him on a on a collision course with about everything uh, in all the right ways. It's a great conversation. Um, somewhere in there, you're gonna you're gonna hear about uh, an auction uh, for a, a pair of cleats. Uh, that I wore for my cause, my cleats in the NFL game. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's either tw- uh, it would be 2021. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm or 2022 season. Uh, they'll be signed along with a signed jersey and even a video, um, a cameo, so to say, uh, with whatever you want me to say appropriately. Be respectful, guys. Uh, but a wonderful show with Pat. Um, can't wait for you guys to listen to it. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, this is Hidden Pearls Podcast. Welcome to the podcast. We are Hidden Pearls Podcast. I'm here at Bruce Kittle with George Kittle, and we have fucking Pat McAfee on. We are really happy to have him on, so that's really cool. So, Pat, thank you very, very, very much for joining us. Um, and I, I just want to, uh, I guess we got into this because we saw you at WWE. We're going to get into the WrestleMania stuff. Uh, you were a great host, and really appreciate everything that you did. We had a super great time. So, let me do a quick little bio on you that I put together. Could be complete bullshit, so you can clean everything up uh, you want. You're originally from Plum, Pennsylvania. You were a great soccer player. You eventually turned into a kicker in football. It seemed like it was your second choice. We don't have to get into that. Uh, you end up going to West Virginia after a really cool thing about Miami. I got that in here. We can talk maybe. Seventh round pick by the Colts in 2009. Then you guys went to the Super Bowl your rookie year. We won't talk about that. Played in, uh, made two Pro Bowls and all pro in 2014, I believe. Eventually retired from the NFL in February 2017 after a great NFL career. And then you just fucking blew the doors off of everything. Got to the star, Fox, ESPN, Alice, host of the Pat McAfee show, all that kind of shit. So it's been really cool. And uh, I was texting you earlier, and it, it was like putting, I really I felt like I was hurting cats trying to bounce around your career. So anyway, kudos to you. And we want to get into kind of that stuff. But anyway, so how's Pat? How's the trip back? And everything going good in your world right now before we dive into all that stuff? Hell yeah, everything's great, man. I'm very lucky to be here. I'm talking to two absolute dogs. It was very- oh, wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Bruce. Oh, hey, I'm called Pat McAfee. Come on, dog. Oh, too that be George. I mean, damn. I didn't know Bruce still got yeah, you, you look good whenever I saw you on Saturday and got a chance yeah, to have good. you in the wonderful family. Yeah, look great. Genetics look fantastic for old Georgia in the future, but damn, I think you look that good at a tank top. You should wear it more often, Bruce. Thank you for having me. Thank you guys for being so cool on Saturday. I'm very pumped to be here. Lucky to be here. Well, really cool. So, well, let's jump in first. So last Saturday, WrestleMania 39, and really I'll let kind of George tell that whole story. You guys talk a little bit about, I just think it was really cool, and I saw the piece you did on your show about it, and I thought it was all really neat, but I just know that it was really special, I know, for George to be a part of that and all that kind of stuff, and The Miz was great in the whole piece, all that kind of stuff. So I don't know, George, you want to kind of roll with that and just let's go over a little bit about how that went down and uh, all the ringside stuff. Yeah, I mean, it was. Uh, I I feel like uh, I've been. I saw Pat at last WrestleMania backstage. I was awesome. Got a few after his match. It was really fun. Um, and then I would say the whole season, the whole year, I was kind of like pestering him a little bit, like, "Hey, if you ever need backup, I got your back. You ever you need me to hit someone with a chair, I got your back." And it was just, I told him I was going to WrestleMania, and then he was like, "Hey, you know, just uh, remember you said you, you were watching my back. Just be ready for something." And so. I was with WrestleMania, you know, high hopes that, you know, Pat might need me and like dreams come true, baby. And Pat needed me there in that time of need. And so that's kind of how I saw from my perspective, Pat, you know, he has his view of it too, but it was pretty special stuff. Yeah. I remember you coming on the program talking about uh, my show, potentially, you know, watching my back, whatever you need. And I was very thankful for that, especially because, you know, I just saw the genetics from the old man there with the, uh, 
the tank top. Well, you're a six foot four monster. You're a beast. You're athletic. You have charisma oozing out of every pore in your body. And you wear so many WWE shirts, the games off season long. I knew that you understood the business inside and out, and you're a massive fan. So seeing you at last WrestleMania, getting a chance to hear about you saying, hey, I'll dive in there and help you out if you need it. You know, it was nice to know that you were sitting there front row in a perfect spot. And, you know, because Miz, we were big fans. We were, we were big fans of Miz. Great guy. Probably. Probably a great guy. You know, but he puts out an open challenge out of nowhere. Nobody really knows that I'm there. Miz didn't even know I was there Saturday. And then he's about to quit, you know, because he's in a $10,000 suit. Cut my fingers off the the gems on the suit, actually. <laughs> Spawn Buster. He's going to quit the match. He thought he was bamboozled. The WWE Universe wouldn't have deserved that. Didn't deserve to see Miz in action. So we're all kind of bummed about it. You were telling him, hey, Miz, get back in the ring. We want to stay here. We love you. And then that. A little pepper tantrum. He pushes you. You, that tank top looked amazing. I mean, the tight end here of the tank top looked amazing. <laughs> You know what, T, you, you know, just, uh, we just take ever, you know, I just, I know that the tight end brotherhood has my back. So I'm not tying. I was like, it's, it's just time to represent just in case that zipper came down quick too. Like it was, I was, I was and you were thinking about, it. you were thinking about wearing that tank top for what, like week and a half, probably before resolute week and a half, not just know. in case you start thinking like maybe week and a half, two weeks. Yeah. Oh, I bet two weeks beforehand, never took it off. Uh, just like, I didn't know because like he was getting all this hype for WWE. A lot of stuff was happening. I was like, you know what? Something could happen at any moment. So I'm glad I didn't have to wear it today. It's wonderful. I wore a different shirt on Sunday for that second WrestleMania for the first time in two weeks. My wife is happy. Thank you, Claire. Um, that out. Yeah, no. Shout out, Clark. Uh, you, Good. George, you killed it. George, you absolutely crushed it. I think you got a chance also to kind of chat with, um, some big name folks behind the scenes. And I'm assuming that's not the last time we will see George Kittle with the WWE and the WWE is a lot better for that, but it was a blast, Bruce. I'm happy it all kind of worked out how it did, but obviously none of us knew how it was going to all go for 10 days or so beforehand. None of us had any idea how it was going to all go. So I was very lucky and thankful for you, George. There you go. Dude, watch. I got that text. Hey, be ready. Tank top was like glued onto me at that point. Just like, it's not coming off. And that was an XL, right? That was an XL too. It looked pretty. It's fitted. That was. Yeah, it's well fitted. It's fitting's all good. Yeah. I did a down. I'm big. Pat, I'm big into arm farm Fridays. And so Friday is just for physiques. You're doing Arnold press it, or yeah, you're just doing all the bodybuilder stuff. And I really appreciate doing that stuff. So I hit a big session before I went to Arm restaurant. farm? Arm farm, baby. Tank tops only too. You have to wear a tank top at Arm Farm. Yeah. Dude, I need to stop by the Arm Farm. I need it for next time. You look too damn good out there. We got to celebrate <laughs> and live and then obviously a couple of drinks afterwards that led us to here. So I'm very thankful for how it all went. Bruce? Yeah, that was great. Well, we really appreciate it. Again, shout out to WWE. That was such a cloud. They do such a great job hosting and we had a wonderful time and we had great seats and it was really fun and good to see George get the action there a little bit. And yeah. We'll see where it goes. Well, down the road, if you have any tips for him on his WWE potentiality, let us know. Okay. Well, I'm going to jump around just because uh, we want to honor your time and all that kind of stuff. So um, your story, Pat, and and you know, when you and I were talking a little bit about this podcast, we kind of like to get to some stuff. And so it's called Hidden Pearls in part because we like to find the hidden pearls out in the world, both people doing good stuff and organizations out there. And we're going to kind of roll back to that. But the other thing that we really want to talk about is kind of mindset and how people approach the world and doing all that. And as you know, there's a lot of folks, you know, we get kind of get a message to, you know, go to school, get a degree, find a job, you know, punch a clock and do all that kind of stuff, which, you know, that is what it is. But then there are other folks who kind of ride a different wave. You know what I mean? And you've clearly found a wave that you like to ride. So there's a great story about you getting from Plum, Pennsylvania to West Virginia. And I'm just going to summarize it. And we don't have to tell the whole story, but I do have a couple questions just about mindset because you're still in high school. And at the time, Originally, it seems like being from Pennsylvania, you thought you were going to go to Penn State. You're a great soccer player. You win the National High School kick or pump pass and kick kind of competition. So everything's going good. Penn State's kind of pushing you along. Yeah, we love you. We love you. We love you. But anyway, and then I think it was your junior year, you compete with some other dude. You crushed him. Didn't think it's any big deal. All things are going well. And then out of nowhere, going into your senior year, Penn State signs this guy that you beat the pants off during summer. And it's, it's really a betrayal. 
And I like telling that story because, you know, I'm not a big Penn State fan, so they can go, you know, where. But anyway, so anyway, so they kind of led you on and then dumped you. So now Penn State comes around because your dad shoots out a bunch of film. That sounds familiar, right, George? Anyway, um, and so then out of nowhere, though, Mike McCabe calls you. And he runs this kicking combine kind of thing for high schoolers down in Miami. And he says, Pat, you're not coming. What's on the list? Anyway, so here's the story I got. And I could be way off. You borrow 100 bucks from a buddy. You lie to your folks, you go to an illegal gambling place beneath a bar or restaurant or someplace, and you double down. I can't remember what, it was like Joker's Wild or some kind of hand, but anyway, you win 1400 bucks, just enough to pay for a plane ticket. You fly down that next weekend, and you kick, and if I'm correct, you made a 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, and 65 yarders consistently in a row, the only guy on the whole field to do so, and basically after being slided and nobody really knowing who the hell you were. The only miss was a 70-yarder, which was plenty long and went wide right, if I got it right. Okay. So anyway. Wow. So then no, after that, I was a dog. You were a dog. So then you hop in the car, fly back, and like that next, a day or two later, the recruiting coordinator or special teams guy, whoever from West Virginia that was at the deal, shows up to the high school, offers you, and the next thing you know, you're going to West Virginia. So amazing story. So you're a senior That's in high school. Awesome. You do all that. So and. My my take was that your mom and dad weren't really down for you doing it because you already committed to Kent State, so they weren't giving you floating you any dough. So, I guess my questions are: I mean, for a high schooler to do that, you got to have a lot of panache. So, where was all this belief in yourself, and what were you kind of thinking about as you went into that whole deal to take this kind of chance? I mean, I love it—just fearless and fucking balls to the walls in your role. And so, where were you right then, and how did all that thing come together? I appreciate you doing the research. Bruce, that was awesome to hear. And uh, this is obviously a massive piece of my entire story. And the amount of luck that is in play here is obviously huge. And in that particular era, and George, how old are you? 29. How old? 29. Oh, you're too young. So you're a little bit too young. There was the, uh, I'm 35 right now. There was the World Series of Poker era that kind of happened. And it took over ESPN. And it was literally... Uh, like coverage that everybody seemingly from blue collar working class families watch because a guy named Chris Moneymaker won like seven million dollars. And I think a lot of us were like playing cards. This guy became a millionaire. We don't really have much to do at night. So we would host games in everybody's house. Like somebody's garage would host the game, somebody's kitchen when their parents weren't there, we'd do a game. It'd be like 25 cent, 50 cent Annie's, big blind, small blind. Texas Hold'em was the game that we played. And I kind of got pretty good at it because my grandma taught me how to play cards when I was like eight or nine years old. So whenever Texas Hold'em kind of became a popular thing to do, I kind of already had a base in card playing and strategy. And then Texas Hold'em, I'd watch ESPN for pretty much hours at a time whenever it was on and kind of learn the game and learn how to play. So I was able to pick up a good amount of money. And I think a part of my story is like my dad, truck driver, mom's secretary, I didn't come from a lot of money. Not a well with me, I'm broke, but there was never a point in my life where I wanted to ask my parents for money. Like that is not something I ever wanted to do. When I was in fifth grade, I wanted extras. I decided to start selling cigarettes. I would buy cigarettes for 25 cents and I'd sell them for 50 cents. I was in fifth grade. I was supplying basically the whole town. They caught me with a carton. I almost got expelled and kicked out in fifth grade for selling cigarettes to all the plum boroughs. So like I've always tried to figure out ways to not kind of, you know, bother my parents almost or put my parents in an interesting spot. You know, money's been tight, always has been. The poker became great for me. If I wanted a new pair of shoes, like, okay, I got to go win some poker games and whether it's at our area or somebody else's area. And I had heard about this bigger game that was happening in an Italian restaurant. Had to have at least a hundred bucks to go in there if you didn't want to get bullied by all the big fish people. So whenever I got a call from Mike McCabe in the middle of my chemistry class, we we're talking about significant figures, I do believe. Figgy figgies. The guy's number I still remember because it popped up on my gray snake phone that I had back in the day. 954-274-5963. I still remember the number because when it popped up, I thought I was getting an offer from something. I thought I was like getting an offer from Miami or from South Florida. Like I'm like, oh, this all these videos that my dad sent out must have worked. Cause I was hitting like 70 yard field goals in these videos. I was like just bombing balls, doing things I didn't think anybody else could really do. And 
I was trying to figure out whether or not I was going to do soccer or if I was going to do football. I had like 10x the amount of schools looking at me for soccer than I did for football. My town doesn't create a lot of athletes, at least at that point. Now we're trying to change that. So I think everybody was like, hey, let's just keep this guy in soccer. He's going to make it. I played internationally. I like had a lot of success. I played as a freshman at my high school. Like everything, I was supposed to be a soccer player, but I happened to have a big leg. So Penn State was really the only school that put an offer in front of me after the Penn State situation happened, and that was devastating. So I thought I was going to go play soccer. And then like a month before signing day, I get this text and call in the middle of chemistry class. I answer it. It was Mike McCabe inviting me to the one-on-one picking, uh, like that classic, I wear the hell it was called, competition. And he wanted the guys he was training to compete against guys from across the country that already have scholarship offers. So that's the reason why he even knew that I existed because Ken State had offered me. And at that point, I decided I was going to go try to kick balls to make a living. Strictly a business decision. Wanting to be rich in America. Didn't want to be rich in Europe. So I'm going to kick footballs as opposed to go to soccer. And I don't have to run seven miles. I only have to run three steps. <laughs> I'm going to go with that. So that was reason why I was going to go to Ken State. I was going to try to grind it out and kind of make it to the NFL to kind of help out the family and all the friends. So when he called me and invited me down to it, I said, yeah, I'm in. He sent me some more information. It would have cost like 1500 bucks to get down there with the flight, the hotel, and camp registration because of how late it all was. Really? And I asked my dad if he, if I could go down, and my dad said, no way. Like, we're not just giving up 1500 bucks. Plus, you already have a scholarship. Plus, we get along with the Kent State people. And this is probably all bullshit is what my old man said. Really? Just natural, pessimistic human being. So... I knew about the game and the restaurant. I played soccer in one of the wealthier parts of town growing up. Asked one of the kids on her team, like, hey, come borrow a hundred bucks. Went down to that game, hit a full house, Jack's full at nines on Texas Hold'em early. Had a lot of people in the pot. And I just kind of had to hold on for dear life. I get out of there like 4 a.m., 4.30 a.m., end up with like 1,400 bucks. I get home, my old man's like getting up to go to work. And I'm like, just a stack of cash. And I'm like, hey, I think I need like a hundred bucks or whatever. I'm, I want to go to that camp. And we booked it the next day. I go down there. Friday, I don't really get to kick that much. Uh, Saturday, I don't really get to kick that much. It was all the Florida kids getting the kick. Somehow I made it to the finals on Sunday and I got hot. I was murdering the ball. It was snap hold kick too. It was like NFL snapper. I forget who it was. Louis Aguiar, former punter for the Chiefs, was holding. And I go 20, 20. 20 from the left hash, 25 from the right hash, 30 from the left hash, 35, 40. And if you hit from 50 in the middle, you back up to 55. If you hit from 55, you back up to 60. If you hit from 60, you back up to 65. I went first because I scheduled my flight terribly. I had like a six-hour layover in Charlotte. I was a high school kid trying to make something happen. So they put me up there first. I go. There was a big reaction from everybody there. But I had to get the fuck home to, to make the flight. So I didn't even see what happened with everybody else. And then the next morning, I get a call uh, from Tony Gibson at West Virginia. He was not at the camp, but they had, I think, I don't know if Rich Rodriguez was there or somebody else was at the camp. And he was calling me to tell me that he was heading up to my school and uh, was going to offer me a scholarship. I was not at school yet. I chose to sleep in that morning, right. you know? And so I drove up to school, went straight to lunch. And as I was sitting at my lunch table, he walked in, I had the trophy from the tournament. I guess I won. And uh, told me I had a scholarship offer, and it was like, okay, well, I'm definitely doing that. And then I had to call Pet State <laughs> and tell them I was no longer governing. That was a tough call. Sure. Uh, but yeah. yeah, so lucky. So many things had to go my way, and they kind of all fell in line for me to end up in West Virginia. And then I rode the coattails of Pat White, Steve Slayton, Owen Schmidt, Darius Renaud in that team. And that was kind of my baptism into the football world because in high school, I would just show up on Fridays, yeah. kind of do the game and get out of it. Right. Well, wow. it's quite a deal. And I, I guess it just, you know, the, the one thing about it is that still though, as a high schooler, you know, being willing to chase your dreams and take a shot and take a chance like that. And a lot of people, they just, they don't get off the couch. You know what I mean? And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, they're so afraid of like failing to go down there and take a chance to do all that. And so like, was, is that always been kind of your temperament or your mindset is just like, I got something I want to do I mean, like whatever's in my way. I know I can climb over it. I'm going to break through it or I'm going to do whatever. Like what was it at that age that helped you kind of really make that shit happen? You know, I think like, uh, and I appreciate you saying all those things. I think like, I'm a big, like, what's the goal. Okay. What's the plan to get there. 
and now let's execute the plan. So like I was kicking at camps where like Jeff Reed was at a camp in Pittsburgh and I was kicking there and I was blasting balls over his head. He was the kicker for the Steelers at the time. Then there was like another camp I went to where there was NFL guys kicking and I'm murdering the ball. I'm 17 years old and I'm kicking the ball further, higher, everything. They were much more consistent with where the hell it was going, but I knew my leg was strong enough to potentially do it. So when I heard about this camp, I think I, I enjoy the thought of competition. I wanted to see if there was anybody else out there too that was in high school that could potentially do what I did. So I'm a big like, what's the goal? Well, I like to go compete against some dudes and see what we got here. And I think there's more schools going to be there. It's kind of how it sold to me. Well, yeah. what's the plan? How do we get there? Well, we got to pay for it. How do we end up paying for it? So I can be dad. I got to get that money. Found out about the game. It's like, right. all right, I just got to get into this game now. And then once I get into that game, it's like, let's get hot. And just so happened to do that. So I'm right. kind of like, goal, what's the goal? Okay, how do we get, to, what's the easiest way to get there? Well, got to get the money to get to that camp. Right. And if I get to that camp, I'll be able to execute whatever the hell I need to do. So right. that's like kind of how I face everything. It's like checkers yeah. almost like. But I'm you know, the one thing there. Yeah, but the one thing in that story though, is that you knew you had a strong leg. So there was already confidence established based on, I mean, training and practice and all that kind of stuff. It's not like you just walked out from, you know, it's not like you didn't kick 10 million soccer balls and not that you didn't yeah. kick it. I mean, you put some time in in order to have that kind of confidence. And so based on the foundation that you built physically, knowing that you could do it and had the strength, leg strength to do it, then you were willing to take the shot to go see who the hell's out there and what you could show. So, well, kudos to you. So, all right, we got Bruce, to Bruce, Bruce. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on there, Bruce. Don't worry about it. Like, I think that's a, a valid point because growing up, I didn't play video games. I didn't really watch uh, TV. I was out either raised in hell, you know, being a terrible kid in my town, or I was kicking a soccer ball against the side of my house. So in soccer, I was known as the kid with the strong leg. Like, oh, that guy can do a lot with the ball. He's a good ball striker. So whenever I, the first time I kicked the football, I kicked the 60 yard field goal. So it was like, I kind of had thought that I'd be able to do it. And I assumed that nobody else would be able to do what I did. But then I go to those camps and I see some very talented people and I learn, I do it. It was just a motivator. So you're hundred percent right. I think it wasn't like I was just dropping into a blind. Like, I hope I can figure this out. Right. There's obviously a lot of work that goes into that type of confidence, I think. Yeah. Well, that's what, and people always ask, well, how do I build my confidence? And it's like confidence. Is there. Yeah. That's, there's no shortcut to doing that. And you know, the one, and we'll tie this back in, I've got just kind of a, a list from 2009 to 2022 of all the shit you've been in, you know, and we won't get to it. But the one thing about it is though, Pat, is like, you know, you started hustling in the area, you know, whether it's football analyst, broadcasting, podcast, doing shows and just finding a niche. And it's not like you didn't put time in, you know, so we'll come back to that. But I mean, it, you know, all that confidence stuff is really earned. So, okay. So let's run then. Okay. Uh, NFL career. I don't want to dismiss that, Pat, but there's some other interesting things we want to talk to you about. So great career, all pro, you know, Pro Bowl, all that, blah, blah, blah. blah. But Hall of, Fame, uh, Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame, Hall George. Hall of Fame, Hall Yeah, there's no doubt. Okay. Hall so, of Fame, uh, In the NFL, we like to talk to the guys that we're talking to. Is a, There's three stages. You're getting in, staying in, and then transitioning out. So um, I have all this stuff about getting in and blah, 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 the Colts and the drama with the Dallas and blah, blah, blah. We, we're going to have to stay on it to me, Bruce. Bang, I, bang. I felt the pain just like Penn State lied to you. So it, it hurts too, but it Okay, we're going to roll over that, though. But anyway, so but you transition in, and I think the interesting story is you were really thinking being a kicker, and they recruited you as a punt, They signed you as a punter, so that's a whole other story. Anyway, year one, you guys go to the Super Bowl, and then not so gloriously. So and I, you and I talked about this, and I just wanted to make sure it was okay because this was such – it seemed like such a pivotal time in your life. So I'm jumping ahead to that 2010. You guys – you got arrested for public intox in Indianapolis, and I, I'll just – like, we don't have to do the whole thing. You know, you went swimming in the canal. Allegedly. Allegedly. Allegedly cops find you without a shirt soaking wet. Definitely. Definitely. They did spent, do that, yeah. Spent the night in jail. And then there's just so many things. And then everything that I read about this, and then you were fined, suspended by the NFL, placed in the NFL rehab program. And in the things that I found about this, that that was a really pivotal time for you, that your dad, I think, didn't take your call from jail. And then he drove from his place to your place, which was a significant drive, and you guys had a bit of a heart-to-heart, -heart, and it was really clear somehow in your life that you, need, you knew you had to make some choices. And so I guess, you know, what I want to just maybe, you know, kind of summarize a little bit about that and then just reflect for us a little bit about how that kind of adversity, which 
I think that's the lesson for me is that, you know, adversity shit happens and all of us fuck up in some ways at different times in our life. And some are more significant than others, but certainly as a second year player in the NFL, having this happen to you in Indianapolis, you know, you're just trying to make your name, obviously not what any of us would want for a player in that situation, but yeah, you turn it around. You're one of the most beloved players in Colts history, really. You're kind of a people, you know, you're the people's kicker. If there's a people's tight end, there's a people's kicker and everything I've read, you were really that people's punter. Yeah. You were one of those guys. Yeah. And so, and everything I've read that this was really an event for you. So what did, what did you learn through all this? How did this shift, you know, your approach to football and really more importantly, how did it kind of shift the way you approach life? Yeah. So Bruce, I, I, I don't mind talking about it at all because you know, like Hunter Smith was the partner for the Colts for like 12 years. He was beloved. He's, I think he actually has a Christian band. Like he is, he's a vastly different individual than I am. Great at what he did. Great human. But the Colts fans, like Hunter the punter was like the guy, you know what I mean? Like they, they actually knew him around town and obviously everything he's given back to the community. My long snapper at the time, Justin Snow, his kid's name was Hunter. Okay. So like... I was I was coming into a situation where, you know, there, there was a lot of history. That was, that team was together for a long time. I came in at the tail end of it. It had like the winningest decade in NFL history. The only reason why I got brought in, I think it's because contractually, how long Hunter's been around. They wanted to save money. It's just classic NFL business. Let's bring in a young guy who I hadn't even done like the NFL style of punting in college. We did the rugby Aussie rules football punt. So like the NFL style of punting, Bill Polian actually told me the day he drafted me, like, we think you'll be athletic enough to figure it out. It's like, I fucking hope so, Bill. Like, you know, like, I wasn't, we played in a super great job. A, really? Yeah, yeah. Like, we played in a Super Bowl my rookie year. I had no idea why a ball was good or bad. You know, like, I'd hit a ball, it was really good because this is what I was told to do. Hey, drop the ball flat, point your toe, swing through it. And I'd hit a ball. And they'd be like, that was cool. And then I would hit a shank and it was like, what happened? I, like, I had no idea. I, I feel like I did everything you were supposed to do. I don't know. I don't know why that happened. So like, it was quite a drastic change from Hunter Smith, who was like a very reliable person for a lot of the people. But I got along with pretty much everybody on the team. You know, I quickly, I've always enjoyed the football locker room. I've always enjoyed the culture. I've always enjoyed being a teammate. I've always enjoyed bringing vibes. And in doing so, especially the position that I was in, like I was living life. Like in college, I was out five, six nights a week. You know, like defense goes out one night, I'm out with them. Uh, offensive line goes out one night, I'm out with them. Quarterbacks go out one night, I'm out with them. It's like I had a communications major. Like, all right, I should be able to figure this out brain wise. Shout out. Too. Shout out. We should be able to figure this out brain wise. And also, like, I got forty thousand dollars in loans out in college because I was on full scholarship just to have a good time because I didn't want to ask my parents for money. And if I ended up not making it to the NFL, like, I'll be in doubt like everybody else. Now, that had like 40% interest rates on it. It was a terrible deal. But I ended up having that money in Morgan County and having a blast. So I, I, I should have focused a little bit more on football, but I was having a great time. I was enjoying myself. I felt like I was a good teammate. Uh, and, you know, that when I got to the NFL, I kind of just continued that. I was out. I'd be with offense one day defense the other day specialist another day just you know the uh the bar staff of indianapolis some days so like i was having a blast we went to the super bowl i had money for the first time ever i wasn't getting in trouble like every time i went out it was a good time like we're having a blast so whenever i get arrested on a tuesday during a bye week you know shirtless and it all kind of you know comes crashing down when i'm sitting in that jail it's like, first of all, I'm nowhere near good enough to be causing this big of a distraction. I know that. I didn't know how to fucking punt. You know, I didn't even have, I didn't even have a clue in my position. Bottom of importance, a totem pole, like no reason to be doing this distraction. And it's like, so I'm going to get fired. Nobody's going to want to sign me. And then when my dad drives over and we have the conversation when he's like, he just reminded me of like, hey, how hard I've worked, you know, all the things I've done, all the stages I've gone through all the steps we've kind of got to to get to this point. You have an opportunity right in front of you. What are you going to do? You're going to throw it away just so you can have a Tuesday night in Indianapolis. No offense to Indianapolis, no offense to Vegas, but like a night is a night, no matter where you are. And you've lived, we've all lived them all like over and over and over and over. 
and over and over again. But I enjoyed that scene. I enjoyed the good times just too much. It was getting to a point where I was being reckless. And that day, it really was a smack in the mouth. The conversation with my dad, Bill Polian fining me and suspending me $40,000. I had no idea you could take that much money from somebody. I had no idea you could ha even have that much money. So that was an eye-opening, alarming experience. And from then on, I just kind of wanted my name to be remembered as somebody that you know, appreciated the opportunity that I had in front of me and also wanted to be somebody that people would be like, hey, that's a friend of mine. That's a guy that is my son. That's a guy I met in West Virginia. That's a guy I met in Pittsburgh. Like, I wanted people to be proud as opposed to people that are like, yeah, that fucking idiot that wasted an opportunity that he didn't deserve is bad. So that was kind of like a, a real mindset changer, life changer for me that I needed. The substance of abuse program was terrible. Absolutely terrible. 27 months. I got tested eight times a month. I eight times a month. I had to call every time I left Indiana and give them like an address that I was at, two phone numbers they could reach. I had a PO pretty much. It was terrible, but I needed it. It set me at a different uh, path. And I think it's kept me, you know, kind of focused on what life could be as opposed to what I was doing, if that makes sense. Yeah, Bill, I got a question for you because just like the NFL locker room, how did your teammates kind of respond after you got arrested? So everybody, you know, I'd been out with pretty much everybody. So, you know, everybody kind of, kind of, you know, like, saw coming. Not, yeah, no, I don't know. I don't think they saw it coming, but like when it happened, it wasn't like a, it wasn't like a big surprise. It was like, Hey, I really don't respond. Like Peyton went to bat for me with Bill Polian because Peyton and I have become tight. And I think there's a chance Chris Polian and Bill Polian just get rid of me. But Peyton, obviously, and I think all my teammates were very like, "Hey man, supportive. here we go." Yeah, very, very supportive. Awesome. When I walked back when I walked back in the facility. I had, I don't want to say representatives from every room, but I think you understand what that means if you've ever been in there. They've come over to me and be like, "Hey, anything we appreciate you. We're on your side, but you got to stop fucking up too." You know, so it was like, uh, it was a good moment. It was a good moment, I think, for me personally, and also for my growth with everybody in the building. That's awesome. Yeah, it's just, it's cool to hear fun locker room stories because it is like locker room is a, it's a private space, but to hear that their acceptance for you and their support for you, it's just fun because of a very similar locker room. Our guys always support each other. And it's just fun to hear how the NFL is such a cool place. It is. Yeah. The NFL is so cool, man. You know, I, I talk about this like I've smoked cigarillos with dudes from Compton and I've sipped wine with sons of billionaires. That's a football fucking locker room. You know what There's I mean? There's no blazer. It is everything in there. And then you also add in the training room and the equipment managers. Like everybody was worried about me, I think mostly, but everybody wanted me like, hey, let's use this and let's kind of, uh, let's go forward. I was very thankful for it all though, George. So it's yeah, that's awesome. Well, it's cool that people. that people, they can offer the support and at the same time hold you accountable. You know what I mean? It's like, like you're, you're welcome back, you know, but we got to get it straight out. And so that's a pretty- And this is the NFL, pal. We're playing for Super Bowls here. We don't need- yeah. You know, like let's dial it in a little bit. You only got figure it out. I don't want to waste it in the areas that don't yeah. waste it. Right. It was a big, hey, it was a big, hey, figure it out, dude. Okay, we like you around here, but like you are nowhere near the person who could get away with doing what you were doing. Like that is, you know what I mean? It was, uh, yeah. it was a good message from all parties, and hopefully, I'll maintain the uh, the mindset that I gained from that entire process on October twentieth, two thousand ten. All right, so. In addition to modifying kind of your nightlife and the way in which that interacted with your NFL career, I mean, I read some stuff too, though, where I think it was Adam Vinatieri, but maybe not. I don't know. But people were talking about, hey, you might kind of look at your diet, what you're eating, and maybe you might want to try lifting a weight occasionally, and you might think about training somewhat. I don't know. Maybe that was overwritten or not. But like, did you also, though, not just kind of change your mindset in relation to like going out and all that, but like you really kind of refocused on football and kind of changed some things, or is that a little bit overstated? So I was a strength and conditioning all American at West Virginia. Thank you, Bruce. Thank oh, you, okay. George. Okay. Uh, thank you. Okay. Mike Barwis. I'd never lifted a weight before getting there. And then by my junior year, Mike Barwis, because my legs, I was, we were an Olympic lift school. So I was hand cleaning. Yeah, right. I was hand cleaning the world pretty much. But whenever they put the stats out there of what I was, I think I was against all the other kickers. It was like, let's give this guy the strength and conditioning all American non. And who knows if that's real or what it means, but I took it very seriously. I, I, I really, but I was drinking every night still and eating terribly, working out, kicking well, 
So as I grew grew older in the NFL, you know, when you're drinking like 30 beers, it kind of slows down your digestive system from what I've been told. And my body wasn't reacting exactly how it had used to. But I was a big like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Because I was still bombing balls. And I always said like, you don't see many designated hitters that are small. You know, like normally big bodies. Like I was up to like 260 at one point, 250. I want to put full ass into this thing and really go for it. And Adam Vinatieri gave me a nice professional chat about, hey, you know, if you were to maybe get a little bit leaner, maybe your joints wouldn't hurt as bad. Maybe your knees wouldn't hurt as bad. Maybe your ankles wouldn't hurt as bad. Maybe your hips would be a little bit more flexible because they could get up past the gut that you're holding or whatever. And I was like, valid point, valid point. <laughs> so I really locked it in. I tightened it all up as I got older. And it uh, it certainly helped me. And I was scared it was going to hurt me because I would lose weight. And it had a complete adverse effect. It made me so much better, so much more energy. Obviously, I feel like I always had good vibes, but the energy level was always there and my body reacted a lot better. So it was, I did have to have a conversation. Some people had to talk to me and I was looking a bit sloppy, but please know the ball always traveled far, but it certainly started traveling a bit further when I got in much better shape. It wasn't a fat ass. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Okay. Well then let's, um, so can I ask a question real quick? Yeah. Go George. Yeah. What was like your favorite, uh, like I didn't say cheat meal because you probably ate pretty bad. But like, what was your favorite like go to meal after a practice or something? So I grew up in Pittsburgh around all, all Italians. I grew up around all Italians. Like, I am one of the only Irish kids out of an entire community of Italians. So, like pasta, pizza. I grew up with it. Then I come out to Indiana. There's zero Italians out here. Like, actually zero Italians out here. So it was a little bit of a culture shock. But you'll find me with a pizza four nights, five nights a week back in the day. Like, I want pizza, I want pasta, and then I'm just going to slice on. Yeah, and then obviously I became a rather fat ass through that whole fraud scenario. I had to cut it back a little bit, but I'm still a pepperoni pizza guy. Below. How about you, George? Uh, I like pepperoni, and then I am a big believer of like sausage pineapple. Pineapple, I'm a fan. Pineapple on pizza is delicious. I get that it's weird. People can hate it. I think it's amazing. I don't think it's weird anymore. I I am a good. Not the pineapple on pizza guy. I think we've so overcome to that point. So good. It's so good. It's like it's that's like Hawaiian, Hawaiian, dude. I think that's the Hawaiian is right talking Italians. I think I'm not hundred percent sure, but they contributed in a massive way. I do appreciate the pineapple being added, but that's like fruit, you know. So whenever I have a cheat meal and I eat pizza, I put pineapple on there. You know, am I like healthy? Yeah, am I healthy? You tell me. Fit fan, fit fam, hashtag. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, well, Pat, then just kind of as we transition, because I want to get into the WWE and all the other stuff you've been doing, but like, um, what was your mindset practice then? Were you a meditator? Did you Were you a visualization guy? I mean, I mean, kicking in my mind is such a mental game. You know what I mean? And particularly place kicking. I don't really, you know, I know a couple of punters from my college days and all that kind of stuff, but like, what was your, what was your mental practice at that point? for getting ready for games and like big moments where you had to, you know, maybe it's raining, you got to get a great punt off the five yard line or that kind of thing. I mean, how did you deal with all those things? So I kicked in college, you know, and I had a chance to hit I had a few game tires that would send it to overtime. And uh, I got a chance to kick a couple like extra point game winners, uh, one extra point game winner, never had the opportunity to win a game, you know? So I always, it was either game tie, we lose, see you later. And when you're in the soccer world, you got like 90 minutes kind of give effort and figure it out. When you're kicking and punting, you're just dropped in there. If you fail, you got like maybe an hour and 20 minutes to kind of wait until you get a chance to kind of go redeem yourself. So the mental aspect of it, battling through being on a field once every hour almost, once every 30 minutes, as opposed to in soccer where I was involved in everything. Like soccer, I won as, and if I was having a bad day, uh, hitting a ball, striking a ball or like touch, I could get more effort. Like, all right, I'll just, I'll affect this game with my effort as opposed to what my skill is today. With kicking and punting, like, if you're having a bad day, you can't out effort it. It's like, hey, you gotta. So the mental aspect of it was always something that I couldn't really figure out how to master. Like, what is my mindset should be? What should it not be? Should I be super calm? And then I, in a massive moment, when I'm super calm, 
kind of get re- too relaxed and I don't use perfect form and I pull a ball. It's like, oh, should I get jacked up? Well, then you get jacked up and you kind of swing through too quick and you kind of go underneath. So like finding my mental game as a kicker or punter, as opposed to what I was growing up in every other sport that I played was certainly a journey for me. And then it wasn't until I got to the NFL where I had the incredible honor to be around Adam Vinatieri, who's maybe the most mentally tough human, if you think back through sports, the most clutch human in sports, one of them in sports history with what he's been able to accomplish and how he's been able to accomplish it. So just living in his back pocket and realizing that when he's kicking a field goal on Wednesday, in his mind, he's not Wednesday in Indianapolis. In his mind, he was able to put himself into the Super Bowl against the St. Louis Rams 49 yards from the right hash. And it's like the kick in practice on Wednesday, if it does not go through the uplights, same reaction of if it was a miss on Sunday. He's fucking furious. It's like, and then if he makes it, it's just like, all right, let's go to the next one. And Jim Caldwell, who's my coach when I got to the Colts, always talked about how the great ones are able to put themselves in a situation long before they've ever been in this situation with the way they work mentally. I got to witness it with Adam Vinatieri. And I think around like my fourth year in the league, third or fourth year in the league, right. practices practices were gained. You know, when I got out to practice, it wasn't just up hitting balls. It was like, all right, what's the moment? What's the situation? And mentally, I was able to kind of check in to a situation. And then whenever I got around to Sunday, it was like, I've been here for three days already this week. I'm feeling good about it. And it was just kind of like a not a walk in the park. You still got to execute, but it was easier mentally to just kind of not get up too high or too low. It was like, I've already been here. I've already done it. But that trick, that visualization, I guess, is, is what that would be a form of, is not something that's easy to acquire. And it wasn't easy for me to do every single day at practice either. That's like what separates Vinny from everybody else because there'll be some days where I wasn't able to like check in, it'd be like, today was a waste almost. Like I hit balls, but did I really get better? Does this mean anything for Sunday? And then some days I get in there, I was like, hey, today was a purposeful practice. Like as those days became a higher proportion of my days, I got much, much better. And it was not something that was just easy to kind of drop into. George, I assume you're able to do that because of your elite level, but that is not something that's easy to do, I don't think, for a lot of people. No. So when you talked about, like, that's the thing I've always, you know, like punters are people. Like that's a, that's a joke. That's really funny to me. Uh, shout out. Yeah, for sure. Shout out. But like specialists aren't treated a little bit different because the, your guys aren't grinding in training camp. It is different. Like it's a completely different job. And I'm, I'm not saying it's any like less difficult by any mean, but like the mental side it of it is. from this. Yeah. For just like sitting on the bench in Lambeau field and Robbie gold is just ready to go to kick a game winner at the playoffs. Like just. To be in that mindset and just have that killer switch, it's crazy to me because like you were talking about trying to get to a flow of it. And um, what I realized in college was I wasn't like, I didn't get a ton of targets in college and that's no one's fault. Like, you know, I, I had my own story in college and it took me to be successful, but like I would use the run game as a, I'm just going to beat the shit out of someone that's in front of me and give it a higher effort than everyone else in the field. And I'm going to get into the rhythm. And then once I'm there, the second they call a play that I'm going to get the ball on, I'm going to kill the person in front of me. And so I have that ability and like the kicking, the snapping and stuff, you guys don't have that. You have no other opportunity except for that three kicks you get when 30 million people are watching. And if you don't, if you don't punt it toward the guy calls a fair catch, everybody hates you. Everybody. Yeah. Like there's nothing you could redeem. Like, Hey, I could miss a block. I could drop a pass, but I could totally redeem myself. And your guys' opportunities to redeem yourself or just to build yourself back up is just, you got like five shots a week max and it's just. I appreciate that because it's really difficult to do. And like to be in that mindset, it is very difficult, especially you're kicking a ball. And like that's the only thing you continue to do. It's wild. George, I appreciate you saying everything you're saying there. And our job is a lot easier than your job. Okay. And I think that is physically factual. Yeah. yeah. Factual and mentally. But like that mental thing, I could I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure it out for in college. I kicked I punted the uh, Aussie rugby putt and then I kicked off as well. So at least basically every series I was doing something, you know, I, I get in, I get into the NFL. I'm, I'm just putting and kicking off. And if we're turning the ball over and not scoring, there's a time where I'm not hitting the ball until second half, like two quarter. I'm just, I'm like dropped into the game, you know, middle of second quarter. We're an hour and a half into it. I'm like, God, all right, here we go. This might be a play. 
this is my first play. Like there is like, you don't have time to get jitters out either. It's like figure it out. So like the mental part of it, I don't want to say I was mentally weak for a long time, but like getting a chance to kind of talk to Vinny and watch Vinny work. It was like, okay, this is what I got to do. I got to figure out how to do it, but it's not easy at all. And the guys that last a long time, like Robbie, what a dog, dude. Robbie's such a dog, especially with everything that went through with Chicago and everything he's got going on. It's just, it's draining out of serve for those guys. Like I played eight years and I got out of there. If I was a kicker who played 15, 20 years, I have no idea how they had the, uh, you know, the competitive stamina, I think, to remain in that stressed mentality that you have to be Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then on Sunday, obviously, for at least four hours. And shout out to that dog, I think, that just walked through the back there. That's the Beanie. That's, that's Dini. Shout out Dini. to the dog, Dini. Okay. But yeah, I, well, let's say, uh, because... Let's, uh, as you mentioned about getting out, so I think that's a good point. And we we like to talk too about intentional and deliberate practices. You know what I mean? And I think that's kind of what you, for your position, the way in which you have to do that in the visualization part. So we're going to come back to that. So somewhere after eight years, you finish in 2016, I think. And then in February 2017, you announce your retirement. Oh, there's the Diener. What's up, dog? Oh, oh cutie. Yeah. She, she she's just sitting here. Yeah. I mean, what were the factors that led you to, you know, when, when did you conclude? I mean, were your, was your body having problems or were you just tired of it? Or like, what was going on, you know, that led you to that decision? And then I kind of want to get into some of the next steps that you've been working on. It felt like the universe was kind of telling me it was the right time to get out. You know, like I was staring down my third knee surgery in like four years. So I swung hard every single time I kicked the ball. I didn't have the perfect form that everybody else had, but I'm going to swing hard. Like I was hyperextending my knee pretty much every single time I punted a ball uh, just because my quad a bit stronger than what my knee joint was able to keep up with. So my final year, I dislocated my kneecap in my kicking leg and it stayed dislocated. It wasn't like a sublex. It was an actual dislocation. So my kneecap, my patella was sitting outside of the track that it was on, which was obviously incredibly uncomfortable. It was no thought at all. It hurt like hell. I wasn't really able to walk days that I punted, but I felt like I had to practice to punt good on Sundays. So I'd punt on Wednesday, punt on Thursday. Wouldn't really be able to walk on my leg. It was just a nuisance. And then Sunday, I would get toward all shot. I would punt. And then Monday, I wouldn't be able to really walk. And then it was like, I, I got to experience what it was like to be a tough football player, you know, for like right. eight, eight weeks. That was in my kicking leg too. Made the pro ball, no big deal. Okay, this, okay, the Patella, made the pro <laughs> ball. No, no deal. Pat. Damn, Pat. Drop the mile. Like, all right, so uh, 2021 season, I was dealing with like uh, tenosis in both my Achilles. And the it is so much more difficult to play football when you feel like absolute dog shit every day. I couldn't yes. even imagine you. I couldn't imagine your uh, position. Dude, I because I was like, I was like a walking on peg legs every day. Like I had heaters strapped to my Achilles every day throughout every rep of practice. If I wasn't in, I had heaters on my Achilles. So they got cold, I could hardly walk. And that was like, and then I we, we figured out a remedy for it and I haven't developed it since last season. Awesome. Oh, yeah, science. Oh, oh yeah, science. Oh. Thank goodness. The only people that helped me, I could throw out a list. I went, I tried everything, but like the mental grind every day, I'm just like, okay, I have to show up and I have to try to get better than it. And I don't, I can't use this as an excuse because it is what it is. I've just got to deal with it. And it's just, it's a grind, but it's, it's, it's crazy just to even think about that we did that. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And your life is not that much fun. And like like my wife now, who is my girlfriend, Sam, she was an angel through that thing with the game ready, obviously, as soon as I get yeah. home. And the, the pants that are kind of flushing it all and everything. Yeah. She had to deal with a miserable human there my last year. But there was a lot of things that kind of pieced together. I was really enjoying what I was doing off the field. I um, Both from my foundation and other foundations that I was helping with, I had a podcast that I was doing off the field while I was doing. I did a stand-up comedy tour while I was in the league. I had a merch show, uh, store that I was running that I was having success with. Like everything I was kind of doing off the field, I was able to see that there was money to be made. And I was feeling like actual fulfillment. I felt like I was making people's lives better as opposed Sick. to just jogging on the field whenever the offense failed on fourth down. You know, so it was like, it was a little bit of a mental struggle and. I always felt this way because I grew up an NFL fan in Pittsburgh and I had so much respect for my teammates 
and everybody like if I'm not going to be all in committed, like I don't deserve one of 32 spots. You know, like my teammates deserve somebody that their full focus and intention of life is going to be to punt the ball. Like the defense deserves a guy that all the time he's worried about punting a ball. And I got to a point where it was like the GM didn't like me. I didn't like him. My knees were kind of getting to a point where it was like surgery almost every off season. But that was a thing. I was feeling a lot of fulfillment out off the field. The NFL provided me an incredible opportunity to take care of my family and friends, get them out of debt, kind of restart life and be on like a head start amongst life as a whole. So it was just kind of like the universe almost telling me like, hey, the time is now. Now, my mom and dad didn't necessarily love what I thought the universe was saying when I was saying it. I still had a couple of years left. I just made a Pro Bowl. Probably no end in sight of me being rather good at what I was doing. And the team I was on was a really cool group of people. And I got to work with Vinatieri, but it just felt like everything was aligned and saying like, hey, you got to go do this. And um, yeah, it's worked out now, but there were some days where there was a lot of doubt. And there were certainly times where I was still putting balls behind the scenes just in case it's all been stumbling down and I had to get back in there. But yeah, just felt like the universe was kind of saying like, boom, 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 boom. The time is now, although from the outside looking in, a lot of people were vastly confused by it all well Pat, you know I, I just think that's another s step about the confidence and all those kind of things because being being able to trust and listen to your own intuition and the voice inside you call it the universe which is kind of similar language that we like to use that there are kind of energetic forces and if you're paying attention and when you get to the point where you're fighting upstream against a lot of those influences and forces I mean it just eventually it is going to come crashing down on you so kudos to you for kind of finding that and having a plan uh, georgie did you have a question as we jump into it or are you just showing off dini no i did so you said that like when did you she's fine it's fine don't know all good with dini all good claire yeah no we're we're dog friendly. Oh, she's podcast. sleeping no she wanted to take her outside but she's sleeping um i was gonna say sorry the um when did you stop like continuing to punt behind the scenes like when did you be like i'm yeah how many years out okay so when i decided to retire at this point i had already done a stand-up comedy tour uh i've already done like seven shows kind of podcast that had a pretty good amount of downloads at a merch store that was making okay. six figures worth of money i mean it was things were going well you know when i decided to retire i had like seven hundred and fifty thousand followers on twitter maybe and when I just, I had a agent that I didn't really, I focused on Twitter a lot. That was kind of my bread basket. That was, that was kind of how I got through a lot of the times where I was getting drug tested eight times a month, by the way, when all my friends are out drinking and having a good time, I was just kind of tweeting and living my life. So when I retired, I had somebody that was somebody else's agent, like kind of send out a feeler and be like, and ESPN, would you want anything to do with this guy? Just made a pro hole. Things would be very well liked has already has his own show, like everything like that. Hey, Fox, you want anybody? NBC, you want anybody? CBS, you want anybody? They all said no. Like they literally said no so quick. The agent actually told me that they've never heard a quicker no in the history of TV. I was like, yeah, geez, that's great news. I guess because I'm a punter, I swear I have a public intoxication arrest. I'm an internet guy. That's not really what people want in the sports media world. So I was going to build my own app. And I was, and I was just going to charge people like, two bucks a month and I was going to make a daily podcast because my Twitter following is like the coolest group of people and they were very loyal and it's like I'll just make my own app it's called the it was going to be called the Moxie app and I already have the wireframe for it, everything still to this day and obviously Big Cat in Portnoy heard about that over at Barstool they heard what I was going to do we met up at the Super Bowl out at the Niners got it or at San Francisco got a chance to chat with them kind of explain what was going on I'd been a fan and they said, Hey, like we would love to have you kind of join our umbrella. Uh, that's why we have the investment. We just got the churn in investment so we can sign talent and everything like that. So I didn't want to move to New York though. I kind of enjoy living out, you know, with some space and quiet. I don't mind that whole thing. So when Barstool kind of created us as an umbrella company underneath them out here in Indianapolis and we got to run it, I thought like, okay, we're good. But then, you know, the internet is a crazy place. You have no idea what you're going to do. Like, you have no clue what's going to go, what's not going to go. You have no clue who's going to be successful, who's not going to be successful. You have no clue what you're going to say and how it's going to be taken by some group of people. It's like 
the digital game, if you can end up being successful like Dave, like Big Cat, like PFT, like Hank, like a lot of people over there at Barstool have been able to do, like that's an incredible feat. So I didn't stop punting until two years, probably three years after I retired. I still wanted to be able to have it just because I had no idea if I was ever going to make it. You know, like I had no clue because there were so many talented people at Barstool. We were kind of just in the mix over there in our own world. So not in the building, but in our own world, within it all. We had no idea what was going to happen. So I kept going a couple of years. Uh, there was COVID year. I was almost back. The Buccaneers made me an offer. They went on to win the Super Bowl. Um, their kicker and their punter got tested positive for COVID on Monday. All my old coaches from Indianapolis were down at Tampa Bay. They've seen me kick. They've seen me punt at practice. And they you know, were kind of in a situation where they lost the kicker and the punter. And at that point, nobody was allowed to play unless they stayed in a hotel for like seven days or something like that. So they were past the amount of window where they could bring in a kicker and a punter and stay in a hotel. So they reached out to me and they were like, if you have the antibodies to COVID, we'll sign you to be our kicker and punter this week if that's something you'd want to do. Now the Colts would have had to trade me. I think we would have been able to make that happen. But I was like, fuck yeah, I'm it. So I was going to get the kick field goals and punt potentially for them. And I didn't have the antibodies because I felt the COVID protocol is too good. You know, I was, uh, I stayed too socially distant. You know, I, uh, I had too good of mask mandates whenever I was out and about. I didn't look at people when COVID was potentially being spread by eye contact. I didn't have the antibodies, so I wasn't able to beat all the Buccaneers. Both the kicker and the punter passed the test were back that Sunday. I wouldn't have had to do anything. They go in to win a Super Bowl. I'd be a Super Bowl champion right now, but I was too good at COVID. So this has been something that's kind of happened and lingered, but I stopped a couple years back. I think that would be the time that I stopped it all. That's, that's wild, dude. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Okay, it's crazy, so- dude. We're in the kind of 10 minute window of our hour. So I want to respect that. Well, I guess I just want to do uh, so one of the things about some of this transition, and I really appreciate your comments. Cause like when you read through all the little, th- cause you've had your fingers in a lot of different pots, you know what I mean? To your credit and really balance yourself out. So I think you were talking about there, you went to Barstool. I had somewhere two sixteen seventeen. 17, you started connection and then they started the Heartland edition. I think that's what it was called. The indie thing. Um, yeah. And you started some version of the Pat McAfee show on Sirius XM. So that all kind of started. And then in 218, you signed with NXT to start announcing matches, I believe, somewhere in there. And then from oh. 217 to 19, you got podcasts. And then eventually, though, 218, 19, somewhere in there, Fox or ESPN, some of those guys, and you end up doing eventually, you got college game day, you're on ESPN, you're doing some other stuff with all those guys. 220, then the Pat McAfee show goes to Sirius XM, you're on YouTube. So that's a whole story we should have a conversation about. And then there's, I love it. In 220, you had you were doing the NXT announcing stuff. And then you and Adam Cole got into the deal. You caused him to lose a match. You were an intervener, apparently in, inappropriately. But anyway, you then kicked you come the back out of him. And then you come back uh, and you had your in ring debut in the TakeOver 30, uh, eventually losing to Mr. Cole. But anyway, that's a story. And then you, wow. they moved you in April 21 from NXT to WWE SmackDown. So now you're kind of jumping the stage, you know, which is pretty cool. And then uh, then you got the FanDuel agreement in there as well, which is a pretty cool thing. So that's a whole nother conversation. And then last year we were at Dallas and we saw you at uh, uh, WrestleMania 38. You had the match with Vince and then Stone Cold. And we're thinking that you might have gotten the last Cold Stone Stunner ever to be delivered in a WWE match. So that's a pretty cool trivia question. So congratulations on that. And then we wrap up with all the other things you're doing this year with WrestleMania 39 versus The Miz. So I guess just uh, there's no way to kind of chat about that. And I do want to honor all that. But like, dude, that's, you know, when I first did this, I had wrestling and then I had broadcasting. I was like, there's no way to separate it because it's like you've done such a beautiful job of leaving out of the energetic stuff and standing between Barstool and all that and the way the entertainment industry is. So I guess, you know, go anywhere you want with that. I'm just kind of. Like, what was the vision? Because before you talked about having a goal and how do I get there? Like, I, I'm having a, I'm kind of struggling. Like, how how do you go all that? You know what I mean? Because there's so much shit going on there. But anyway, just tell us a little bit about that journey and some of the key things that helped you be successful and all of that. And George, jump in anytime if you got something. And once again, I, I, I go ahead, George. I'm sorry. No, you go. I'm, I'm going to listen. This is awesome. No, like, I'm very thankful you did your research and looked into my life. I heard a long epitaph there when I heard you talking about it. It kind of all blends together whenever I look at it now because I'm kind of in the middle of the whirlwind. 
Uh, but everything is just like, I think whenever I came out of, out of the NFL and I retired, I was kind of not given any opportunity to do anything. You know, like I retired at 29 with a mindset that I was told by one of the Armstrong brothers, who was the rep, that like the WWE cuts off like signing people at the age of 30. They want to get in the ring. So like that was a part of the universe telling me to retire. I'd already bought a ring. I bought a ring like my second year. Oh, wait, yeah. Hey, but, hey, but I forgot your 2009 match against the War Pig. Yeah, I was undefeated. Yeah. I was undefeated like War Pig. I was undefeated like Goldberg. Long time, long time. Oh, so yeah. anyway, okay, go ahead. Sorry, I just had to throw that. Yeah, that was in Charleston, West Virginia. No big deal. IWA East Coast, undefeated. Hit him with a super kick. Ain't a low blow. One, two, three, get out of there. And that that was like, if I didn't make the NFL, I was going to rest. Like, I was very excited to kind of hit the indie wrestling scene. Like, there was times when I was in the NFL with George out about you feel where I would go to some of these indie shows and I'd be like almost jealous of the fact that they can just do whatever the fuck they want and not worry about hurting themselves at all. Like for me, it was like I can't I can't jeopardize anything right now because I have a career that is way too good for what I deserve. I'm getting paid way too much money for what I do, but I always wanted to be in the wrestling business. So one night when I was pretty boozed up and I had a little bit of money, I found out on the internet you could buy a wrestling ring. I bought one, handed that how much? How much? Just I mean, just in case I was interested. So the one I got is like sixty five hundred, I think, from creation to door. And then I had a barn though. You have to have a barn too, obviously. Yeah. Up, they're big, a lot of space. I'm talking full two by fours, but it was like sixty five hundred seven thousand, I do believe, out the door. Don't know. That's an investment. Seems like a fantastic investment, Pat. Yeah, it was. It was a. It, I would have people over to the house, you know, and everybody would be like, "Well, oh, I'm gonna do the people's elbow," and then they would realize how hard the mat was. But I trained. I trained uh, immediately upon retirement in the ring, and I used to run the ropes for cardio in the off season whenever I was kind of dicking around, and that obviously always bruised me up. And I would have a crash pad, and I'd go off the top rope. I was a trampoline wrestler growing up. So it was like one of the reasons why I retired at the age that I did was because I thought maybe I still had time to get into that wrestling world that I thought I was kind of bored to be a part of. I thought I was I was supposed to be in the wrestling business, I thought, personally, from being a fan my entire life, who I am, how I am, my mouth, everything. Like, I'm supposed to be in the wrestling business. So that was always going to be a part of the plans. So when Michael Cole calls me to be a part of the NXT pre-shows after hearing about my interest in my show... It was like a hell yeah. And I was just happy to get into the door. And then finally, I kind of built up enough courage to be like, hey, I think I'm supposed to be in that ring over there. <laughs> so then they give me the, I get the opportunity for the Adam Cole match because he's a scumbag, that guy. Massive scumbag. Really good in the ring. Massive scumbag. Uh, scumbag. I don't sure they could have Kind of a perfect opponent for somebody that is maybe having their first match of all time. Scumbag of a guy. Just, just bad guy, but. You know, that whole thing. Like, so when that pops up, it just, everything for me is just like, when an opportunity is presented, I have a very difficult time saying no to it because so many cool things are being presented and kind of pitched. It's like, hey, do you want to do college game day in 2019 because Adam Benatieri is not able to do it at South Dakota State? You're a great option. You want to fly out to South Dakota State and do game day? It's like, college game? Yes, I want to do college game day. What? And then they're like, yes. And then they're like, hey, do you want to come next week too? And it's like, yeah. And I have my show every single day. And then they're like, hey, do you want to call it Thursday Night Football? I'm like, yeah, that'd be sweet. I would do it. Hey, do you want to go on Get Up? Yeah, like Get Up would be awesome to do. And then, you know, hey, do you want to do, you want to do SmackDown? We're trying to find commentators. It's like, yeah, being a part of fucking SmackDown is like life or dream. So like, I think everything is legitimately an opportunity presents itself. And then I gather with my guys. We try to put together a plan of how the show can still go on. Like whenever I got offered the SmackDown opportunity in the middle of COVID, we rented a house in Tampa Bay, our own money, my money. We rent a house down there. We build a studio in the living room. We fly down every single Thursday so I can get COVID tested, do the show from the living room on Thursday and Friday in Tampa Bay, then go do SmackDown, then fly home afterwards. And it's like, Everything is just like, hey, here's an opportunity. Do you want to do it? It's like, I'd be honored to do that. Now, how do we make it work with my guys? And I have a crew of dudes that are all incredible, hardworking, driven. They're fucking awesome. And uh, 
yeah, I think we're just trying to make the most of everything, but it has led us into some amazing places and places I could have never fathomed. And I think that's why I always say yes to things, but I am getting to a point where, you know, there's a lot of me, almost too much of me. And I'm just trying to enjoy it all and not piss the whole world off at the same time. And, you know, who knows, who knows what's next to be honest, because I have no fucking idea. Yeah. Well, I love that. And, you know, your reality, that was a really good one because saying yes opens so many doors because, you, you know, if you're always saying no, you never take a chance. Obviously, you don't have any failures or setbacks, but then you never expose yourself to what might be. But then I also know if you get too busy and you say yes to too much, you're saying no to some, you know, by saying yes, you're excluding other things. And so finding that balance about your skill sets. And again, you're kind of one of those guys that's following energetically the flow of the universe and these things, you know, they seem kind of all over the place, but yet there's is a connect the dots kind of thing to it that they all have a synchronicity to them and they overlap. Hey, Bruce. Yeah. So when I did my first stand up ever, I let off. It was in front of uh, 1,800 people. We filmed it. It was a stand up special, first time on stage. Okay. Went for 97 minutes or something like that. Ridiculous. Absolutely okay. ridiculous. But I actually let off with the Steve Jobs quotes. Uh, quote about how you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only go about doing what you're doing, hope that it makes sense later or something like that. So what right. you just did there was like kind of gave me goosebumps, Bruce. I just want to let you know that. That's cool because it's true though, but you're exactly right. But you can always plan it out how they're going to connect. You just have to trust your intuition, your spirit, your energy, and that there there is a flow to it and you just keep continuing to move forward and you hope in the end that they do kind of do that. Well, listen, I just want to, because we're kind of backing up against the time, Pat, the other thing about you is that you do care, and I'm kind of swinging back to our Hidden Pearls part. So, you know, I, I honestly didn't know you too well. I mean, I've watched you on TV. I've seen some of the stuff, but really researching your story is really cool. And I also found, so you got the Pat McAfee Foundation. I don't know very much about that, but I'm just saying, as your own personal growth has kind of continued to take its spiral, you know, you've continued to kind of give back and partner your, yourself with different organizations. Uh, I've just got 2011 Locks of Love. I know 2016 Shirts of for America, Wish for Our Heroes. 2020, in your years with Barstool, you always supported their stuff where people, I think it was the small business fund that where people were going out of business because of COVID and all that kind of stuff. 2021, I know you threw a big chunk, West Virginia Children's Hospital, and that's a favorite of George's, the U of I Children's Hospital and Children's Oncology. You're doing football for underprivileged youth, I think, in your hometown, but it's something like that. And I know you've helped the sports teams back in Plum, Pennsylvania. So I guess, you know, we're swinging back to the kind of the hidden pearl part of this. So one, just kudos for that whole thing and being a role model in that kind of way. And, you know, it's it's great that you've been able to continue to maintain your flavor, you know, and your kind of brand and a little rough out of the edges and all that kind of stuff and that the world's accepted that. But at the same time, you kind of have your feet on the ground and your heart in the community in a way. So tell us a little bit about, you know, giving back, why that's important to you, and maybe have you had any recent discoveries of your own hidden pearls about special people out there that you'd like to shout out? And if you have a charity, we always do a donation to you, a favorite charity. We're glad to do the Pat McAfee, but if there's another one you want to do, we'll do that donation as well. So fire us up a little bit about your giving and your contributions. Hell yeah, that's awesome that you guys do that, and I appreciate you know, getting a chance to chat about it a little bit because that fulfillment I think that you feel from giving back is like something you can't put a dollar amount on. I've been grossly overpaid since I'm 21 years old. And growing up, you know, all I thought was like, money will be the answer, money will be the answer. What is something that money can do? And then once you get money, you realize that like, okay, it's certainly a lot of freedom. It is certainly something that you can experience stuff that maybe you weren't able to experience wherever you didn't have money. But the best part about it, money is being able to give it to other people. Like that is literally my favorite part about it. And it's just like getting to help folks has become almost the main driver for why we do everything. So a contest every single day almost on our show, trying to give 10 people $500 who just randomly tweet things because I feel like the people that watch our show and support it could potentially utilize 500 bucks much better than we could utilize those 500 bucks and when I gave it to that children's hospital in West Virginia, that was the first time I got to experience giving back to the community. That was the first time I did any community service. Bill Stewart, our coach at the time at West Virginia, rest in peace, absolute legend. He's the one that kind of took us over to the hospital and was like, why don't you go hang out with these kids for about an hour and just see what you do for them and in return, what they do for you. So I kind of fell in love with giving back to the community and 
hopefully putting a smile on people's face at West Virginia. So that's why I gave back to that particular hospital because it was a pivotal moment in my life. Back in my high school, like just thinking about me as a high schooler, what I would hope that somebody from my school who has been grossly overpaid would do to help me kind of have the opportunity to go on and be successful is what I always try to think about. So I pre- I, I think I pledged $2 million to our high school athletes. I gave another few hundred thousand dollars to our junior high, all of the other little leagues around there. Like, I just want kids from my hometown to know that if you want to continue with sports and help not only yourself, your family, but also the town as a whole, like all of it is there for you and do not let or do not, I do not want money to be a burden for anybody to kind of maybe change the trajectory of their entire family tree. So that's kind of where I always come from, always trying to give back. If it's just money, it's just money, you know, but also like getting an opportunity to kind of experience and interact with people and hopefully lift their day while they're doing a lot more for you is the true fulfillment that I sought whenever I retired and the true fulfillment that I hope everybody kind of gets a chance to experience and true fulfillment and that I think everybody who was in my position would try to do as well. So I love it. I enjoy the hell out of it. And the CFO of my company, who I've been, you know, friends with literally since kindergarten, he's not necessarily as pumped with how giving I am. You know, I got 13 employees. Uh, so there had to be a little bit of filter because I would literally give everything away if I could. But yeah, I'm trying to help everything at all times. And it's uh, it's what it's all about, I think. And uh, I hope to be able to be in a position to be able to do it for the rest of my life because it's fucking awesome. And uh, yeah, it's very cool. And I appreciate you getting the chance opportunity to kind of talk about it. Okay. Well, then uh, you let us know if, if uh, you want us, we'll just, you let us know where you want us to shoot some dough. We'll do that, whether it's Pat McAfee or not. And so one of our closing questions, Pat, is uh, uh, I guess people know how to get a hold of you. You're pretty public. And so I think that's not an issue. We just want to give you a chance to promote that. But is there something out there that you're experiencing or seeing or a part of that particularly gives you hope kind of for the direction of where we're going as a society and as a culture? Okay, this is real deep. And I, it's probably already been talked about. But those two officers, Nashville Metro PD, that, you know, we saw the body cam footage. Normally when we see body cam footage, it's terrible. It's like the worst in humanity. It like makes us question literally everything that our world kind of has going on. Those two guys, body cams, I forget, Angle Burt out of Chicago and Michael, oh, it's a Paisano name. I forget the exact of it. I don't want to get it wrong because of it. But watching their body cams, how assertive, how confident, how prepared they seem to be running into bullets and then handling a situation that was obviously incredibly negative, traumatic, sad, terrible. I think after watching that, the tiny silver lining that you can take from that terrible, terrible situation is that there's still humans out there like that. And uh, I come from a family where my uncle is an EMT, my other uncle is a firefighter, my cousins are EMT and firefighters. It's like when you see stuff like that, it makes you automatically go, damn, I'm happy those humans are still walking amongst us, just like the military and just like anybody else that's serving our community. So I think those things are awesome. I think that was a great sign of hope for our society. And it kind of let us all know, I think, that there's still a lot of great ones out there we just kind of got to look for them and find them. And hopefully the next time we find them, it isn't in such a terrible situation. Uh, oh, very cool. Well, I appreciate that, Pat, very much. So, Thanks. Georgie, I want to give you any um, any words of hope or other closing comments you want to throw out? Yeah, that, that's that's an awesome point there, Pat, to think of it like that. Yeah, that silver lining is there. Like, thank you to the them for just being prepared and knowing exactly what to do and having the confidence to do that in that terrible situation. And, it's like, I don't know if heartwarming is a word, but like uh, comforting or inspiring, like kind of hits everything on the head when you, people that are in those positions to protect us can do that. So that's awesome. Um, I was going to say when I was at, uh, when we were at WrestleMania this year and the opening match is John Cena and uh, he has like a whole bunch of Make-A-Wish kids out with them. And then it just kind of made me think about all of the stuff that WWE does to give back or what John Cena does with his time, like the most Make-A-Wish is in the history of Make-A-Wish. And just like how many people are out there who are trying to do the right thing and trying to give back, trying to give 
donate money to try to just spend that time with kids and put a smile on their face because they're going through some shitty and that just put a huge smile on my face because it's, it's really fun to know people that give a shit and actually try to do something good with their time instead of you know just being bullshit and you know just being online all day but like people are actually go through it give effort uh because when you're with people or when you're around people that are giving effort towards the right things it kind of makes you a better person as well and it's kind of how i try to live my life i just shot myself with all my best friends who are good people and whether you're challenging each other to do great things or uh, you see them doing great things. It just kind of holds you to a high standard. So seeing that on Saturday and Sunday was pretty special for me. It's contagious, George, isn't it? A contagious almost. And it's also a good like example of like, hey, you're allowed to do this. You know, like, hey, you're allowed to give back. Like John Cena is one of the most busy humans of all time, especially wherever he was with the WWE. And then they tell the stories of everything he's done with Make Wish. And then you hear about WWE's commitment to Connor's cure. And then you think about what the NFL has done. And all the players that do so many good things, it's like, I've been very lucky. We've been very lucky to see a lot of incredible humans. And uh, hopefully the world will continue to spotlight them. And I'm very thankful that this podcast does exactly that. Bruce, you got a fucking good one here, pal. Thank you for having me. Okay. And then speaking of that, I'm going to do a shameless promotion. So April 29th, I'm on in the St. Anthony's Triathlon. It's a fundraiser for emerging cool. bets and players. So we're raising money. And then also as part of it this month, George, these are George's cleats for cause. These are the merging vets and players that he actually wore. They're going to be autographed along with an autographed jersey. We're using NFL charity auctions to promote that. I'll have links either this week or next. They're finishing all the paperwork on that. So these are going to go up for a raisin, and then you can make a donation to support my effort. You can pledge by the mile or otherwise. We're merging vets and players. Again, that's April 29th, St. Anthony's, and the old guy's going to run the Olympic distance try, so we're giving that a shot. So, anyway, look for more announcements on that as we get going. So, Pat, what's a pledge? To... Hold on, hold on. What's a pledge? Like, what's that mean? What do I? I've never done this before. Try it. You're doing a bucket. You're, you're. Yeah. Hold so on. it's a, it's a 1.25 mile swim. It's what? a 20, about 25 mile bike ride in a wide something. What? Yeah. Okay. So, so what do I do here? I, I don't. Well, you the pledge work. So it's like, uh, it's about 33 miles total distance if you want to do that, or you can just make a whatever donation to Emerging Vets and Players, which again, works with retired uh, former military, and it works with former professional athletes as well. Their motto is making sure that you have a team when the uniform comes off. So their big thing is about reducing vet suicide particularly, but suicide mental health is a huge thing. So Jake Glazer, Nate Boyer, shout out to those guys. So we've been involved with them for two years and have a lot of veterans on the show. So I'll have a post draft. I'll give five hundred. I'll give I'll give five hundred dollars for every mile and complete. Let's finish this fucking thing. Now let's go. I don't know how you're gonna get through that swim. I don't know how you're gonna get through that swim. But you're doing it for you Oh, I can Matt, swim Pat. bikes. Swim bikes, my thing. Pat, Pat oh, my dad. My dad has been biking and swimming ever since I can remember. He's a fish, and this dude goes on like forty mile bike rides daily. He's an absolute monster. So uh, he's got a lot of fucking crash. I get uh, 16,500 <laughs> bucks. I'll write the check now. Yeah, wait, wait, that's awesome. All right, well, Pat, I appreciate okay. it. So, Pat's our first official donation. We appreciate it very much. So, oh. I'll follow up with you and send you all that kind of stuff with the links and all that. Anyway, we wish you the very best. We look forward to more partnerships down the road in the future. If there's any way we can help some of the stuff that you're doing, you're going to send me a note about what organization you'd like us to support, and we will do that. And very glad to do it. And then what's the very next biggest media event that we can see Pat McAfee at other than your show? Anything you want to promote? Bruce, I'm in the middle of a lot right now. Okay. There's a lot going on in my world right now. I don't have an okay. agent, so I do all my own negotiations. And uh, there's a lot. There's a lot going on in my world right now. And there's too many people that watch my show. There's too many people that follow me on Twitter. So we need less people to do that because we are making the world dumber every single day. And we do not need to be that type of addition to society. Uh, but my boys and I, we just try to enjoy it every single afternoon. And who knows what's next? I'm playing checkers, not chess. I'm just trying to kind of navigate the world. And hopefully I'll get kinged at the end with my boys. And then we'll try to come back the the board the other way. But I appreciate the opportunity to come on here. Right. And you guys have been absolutely way too kind to me. And thank you for the great conversation. And also, congrats, I believe, right? You're expecting? May 14th. A little baby girl in a way. Come on, okay. so come on. Really, so oh, super happy for you that enjoy that, and well, wish you all the best for you and Sammy. I'm my there. wife is a badass, Bruce. My wife. Hey, we've. Uh, I don't know how many people know our story, and I used to George. 
I know of your family story. We this is our third time getting uh, pregnant, so this has been an incredible journey. Uh, obviously, very very sad times through this whole thing, and now we're getting very close to having our baby, and it has been a joyful, joyous situation and occasion that uh, my wife has kicked so much ass through this whole thing. I can't wait to meet my baby girl. And, you know, that's kind of, I don't want to say directing all of the negotiations I'm taking on right now, but I want to make my life easier so that I can be a very present father because of how excited and eager we are to kind of meet our baby girl here in a couple of months. Wow, There's not that much, uh, when you talk about money, it's just money. When you have your first kid, it changes everything. So it's a, it's a great thing. So we're super happy for you and we'll be holding in our thoughts and prayers as all that comes close. So wishing you the very Thank best. Thank you. Pat, thanks so much for your time. Georgie, thanks for sharing and being with us. All the best and we'll be following you as you uh, set new records and do new amazing things. I'm just a dumb ass trying to get through this whole thing with a good group of people around me. I appreciate you. And tell Beanie, Beanie, I said, uh, thank you for the presence and the nap there. That's awesome. You guys are the best. Cheers. Guys, guys, thank you so much for listening. We loved, loved the conversation with Pat today. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed his story and his mindset, really. Um, I think this thing we kept talking about, just how he inspired himself um, and really just being able to bet on yourself and have the courage to go fail, but um, that courage will also set you up to success. So um, wonderful conversation with him. Bruce, amazing as always. Emma, amazing as always. Uh, I'm just trying my best out here, trying to pull my weight. And hey, also, big shout out, Bruce, with the big triathlon. It's amazing. He's 64 years old, and he's got to kick this thing's fucking ass. Excuse my language, but I'm incredibly pumped about him. Things that he's doing. Swim, bike, run. He's going to kick its ass. So if you guys want to be a part of that too, uh, click the link, donate, follow him. He's uh, on Instagram uh, every single day, posting his journey. So that's really fun. I'm going to try to post everything. All proceeds go to MVP. So it's everything. All the money raised is going to Emerging Bets and Players. All of it. 100% of it, Emerging Bets and Players. It's an amazing cause for former athletes and former military, uh, the people who lay their lives on the line for us every single day. So good vibes, positive vibes. Go out there. Have a wonderful day. Um, and as always, just be great today and you can worry about tomorrow tomorrow.